Amma Ba'd. The second major battle that the Muslims fought was the Battle of Uhud. And we know that one of the most significant things that happened in this battle was the death of the Prophet's uncle who was very beloved to him, Hamza radiallahu anhu. Now Hamza was not just the uncle of the Prophet وسلم, rather they were like brothers because they were very similar to, them, to each other in age. And after this moment happened, Nabi wasalam, was greatly struck with grief to such an extent that he وسلم, said, whomsoever finds the person who killed my uncle, that person has the right to kill him on the spot. It's like a, a shoot, you know, just a shoot to kill order. It doesn't matter where you find him. So who was this individual? This was none other than Wahshi ibn Harb. We've heard this name time and again. Wahshi was a slave at this time, and he was given the opportunity to earn his freedom. All you have to do is kill one person on that battlefield. No one else. Kill Hamza, and you're free to go. So Wahshi waits, and he waits for the right moment. And as soon as Hamza radiallahu turns his back, he takes a spear, and he drives it to the back of Hamza radiallahu because he couldn't face him face to face. There's no one that could defeat Hamza radiallahu anhu in a one-on-one -on -one battle like that. And so he kills Hamza radiallahu anhu, and the moment that he strikes him down, he flees from the battlefield. He doesn't fight anyone else, he only came for one mission, he, he completed his mission and he left. And he runs away, flees from the battlefield and goes into hiding. And from then on, the Muslims have a command from the Prophet sallallahu If you find this man, take him out right away. And this command stays standing for years and years and years. Until eventually the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa does something only the Prophet of Allah could do. What is that? He sends someone to give da'wah to Wahshi ibn Harb. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi forgives him. And he sends somebody. فَأَرْسَلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم إِلَىٰ وَحْشِي ibn Harbin قَاتِلِ حَمْزَ يَدْعُوهُ إِلَىٰ الْإِسْلَامِ Calling him, why don't you accept Islam? Now imagine, by the way, Wahshi is hiding out in Ta'if. He's hiding out in the city of Ta'if and we have heard a great deal about it most likely in this week. And so then the messenger, he comes, the messenger of the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi comes to him. He says the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is inviting him towards Islam. And Wahshi is just as shocked as you and I are. So he responds and he says, Okay, go and tell Muhammad وسلم, this. Go and tell him this from me. Ya Muhammad, ila Islam. Muhammad, how are you accepting, how are you inviting me towards Islam? You mean to tell me you're inviting me towards Islam when your own Lord, your own book says the person who does zina, the person who does shirk, the person who commits murder, that person will be thrown in hellfire, they will be humiliated on the day of judgment and be punished severely forever. That's what your own book says. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the messenger comes back to the Prophet and he says, this is what Wahshi says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals another ayah. And so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Nabi alayhi wa sallam, who tells the messenger, who goes all the way back to Wahshi ibn Harb, and he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said something else. He says, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا And he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this applies to everyone except the person who does tawbah, and the person brings iman in Allah, and then they do good deeds after that. If you do that, Allah will turn all of your bad deeds into good deeds. Now, I mean, that's, that's a pretty good deal, right? Wahshi ibn Harbi hears this. And again, Wahshi being Wahshi, look at how he responds. He thinks about it for a minute and he says, hold on. He said, okay, go tell Muhammad this. هذا شديد. It's a pretty strict condition that you have placed on me here. Right? إلا من تاب وآمن وعمل صالحا. He said, you want me to do tawba and bring iman and do good deeds? I don't know if I can do all of this. I got to do all of these things to get your God's forgiveness. No, 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 this is too much for me. I'm a simple man. I can't do all of this. And so the messenger goes all the way back to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, this is what Wahshi said. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals another ayah. And so the messenger goes, the messenger of the messenger goes all the way back to Ta'if again. And he talks to Wahshi ibn Harb. And he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that just for you. He says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is willing to forgive a person so long as they do not commit shirk. As long as you don't do shirk, Allah will forgive. So it doesn't matter what you have done. Don't worry. You don't even have to do anything. Just don't do shirk. And he says, come on, like, there's no other better deal than this, right? Just don't do shirk. That's all you have to do. While she hears this and he thinks about it for a minute and he says, هذا أرى بعد He said, okay, go and tell Muhammad this. He said, this depends on if Allah wants to forgive me. Because Allah says, لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ What if Allah doesn't want to forgive me then? So then it won't apply to me. So no, I don't know. If, I don't think this is good enough for me either. No, no, I need something else. Give me some. Hal ghayru hada? Is there any other ayah, any other verse in your Quran that your Lord can give me? And the messenger goes back for a third time, and Allah subhanahu wa taala reveals another ayah, and the man takes it, and he goes all the way back to Wahshi ibn Harb again for another time, and he says that your Lord has revealed Subhanahu wa taala. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَصْرَفُوا عَلَى أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا. 
He says that, O oh, my slaves and servants who have transgressed on themselves and you have done sins that you feel regret for and remorse over, don't worry. Allah forgives all sins. All sins. Wahshi, he hears this and he says, fanam. This is what I've been waiting for. Travels all the way to Medina and accepts Islam. Wahshi ibn Harb. Now imagine, a person like, hopefully I don't think any one of us has done anything like Wahshi ibn Harb did. And yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness and the mercy of the Prophet is so vast that he was waiting for them. It just took time. And eventually, Wahshi ibn Harb himself comes to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam opens his arms for him, opens the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for him, and he welcomes him in. And now he is considered from the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَكُلَّنْ Allah الْحُسْنَةِ Allah has promised all of them goodness. Imagine how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can turn a person's leaf. New chapter in their life. All the sins are forgiven. And now we know that that person will be with the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah. We have no idea what future is waiting for us. All you have to do is turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let Allah write your final destiny. It is all in His control. Let's take this moment to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Him for forgiveness. Aqun qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'il al-muslimin fa astaghfiru anna wa al-ghafur al-rahim. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, wahda wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'da. Amma ba'da. I want to make mention of the story of one other Sahabi and then insha'Allah we will conclude. Story of Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu, who was another illustrious companion of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And actually I want to mention the very final moments of his life. Very final moments of his life. He is on his deathbed and his son comes to visit him and he brings some of his friends with him. Now imagine, this is an illustrious Sahabi. Amr ibn al-Asr anhu, he was 53 years old when he accepted Islam. So he was very elder. He was not like a young man. He was older. And he had opposed the Prophet Sallallahu for essentially the entire 20 years of his da'wah. Up until Fatih Makkah, that's when he accepted Islam finally. And before this, he was a man of great wealth, great influence, great popularity, well known in his community and his society. And then eventually he accepts Islam. At Fatih Makkah. And then the Prophet Sallallahu says, that you are a man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless in your wealth because Allah has given you so much wealth and He has given you intelligence and ability. And then we know that He would go on to become one of the greatest commanders of the Muslim Empire. And then He would go and conquer numerous lands. He would become the Fatih. He would become a conqueror. And millions of people would accept Islam as a result of His conquest. This individual who gave, we can't even imagine the amount of wealth that He gave in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His children became Sahaba. His children became illustrious individuals themselves. This person. He is laying on his deathbed. His son comes to see him, Abdullah. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. Comes to see him and people are with him. And the father now, he is in his 80s, very elderly. He sees his son and he turns away. He turns towards the wall, doesn't want to look at them. فَبَكَى طَوِيلًا He begins to cry long tears. And people are like, it's a little bit strange. You know, don't you want to basically, aren't you ready to go? You've lived a great life and you want to go, you don't you want to go back to the Prophet ﷺ? Don't you want to be with Allah at this moment? Bilal when he was passing away on his deathbed, his wife is over him. And she says, wa husna, wa husna. What great sadness I have. Bilal is only 60 years old. Like my, my husband is leaving me at this age. She's greatly grieved at this. And he says, Bal wa tarbah, wa tarbah. No, no, this is good news. Tomorrow we meet our loved ones. Al-Ahibba, Muhammad wa Hizba. Muhammad and all of his companions. I'm happy to leave this dunya. And yet, Amr ibn al-As is on his deathbed and he's sad, crying. And so she stands over, and so his, his, his son stands over him and he begins to remind his father about all of these things. He's like, Dad, you know, look at all these things that you have accomplished. You spent three decades as a Muslim. With the Prophet you spent a few years and then you conquered all of these lands. You donated incredible amounts of, amount, amounts of money in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many people accepted Islam at your hand? You are such an amazing person. You're this, this, this. Amma basharaka Rasulullah sallam bikada. Amma basharaka Rasulullah sallam bikada. Didn't the Prophet sallallahu alayhi give you glad tidings of this, 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 all of these things? And then he turns back to face his son. And he says, my son, the only thing worthy of merit that I consider having done is saying the shahada la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. That's it. And then he begins to tell him, he says, let me tell you my son. Remember, a father will tell his son about his life. So he says, I spent my life in three stages. He simplifies 80 years of his life in three stages. Spent it in three stages. He says, the first stage was one where I hated the Prophet ﷺ more than anyone. There was no one on the face of this earth that I hated more than Muhammad. And he said, all I desired, all I desired was to get close enough to him so I could kill him. That's all I wanted. And if I had done that, I would have been the happiest man in the world. He said, however, had I died on that stage, at that first tabaqa, that first stage, I would have been from the people of hellfire without a doubt. And then, the time came when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expanded my chest for Islam. And Allah put the light of faith in my heart. 
And after that, I came to Medina. He said, I came to the Prophet ﷺ and I accepted Islam at his hands. And he said, from that moment on, there was no one more beloved to me than the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, no matter how much I looked at him, it was not enough. If you asked me to describe him, I would not be able to because I never got my fill of looking at him. That's how much love I had for the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, I had hope that if I died on that second stage after my Islam, I had hope that I would be from the people of Jannah. That's what I hoped for. And then the Prophet ﷺ left this dunya. And then, we, and then, remember, people are talking about all these accomplishments, and I even mentioned some of his accomplishments. Look at how he summarizes accomplishments. Three decades of accomplishments. You know what he says? He summarizes three decades in three words. Thumma wulina al-ashia. That's it. And then we were given some responsibilities. That's all he says. He doesn't mention that I conquered this many lands. I was a commander. I donated hundreds of millions. All these people converted Islam and accepted Islam in my hands. He doesn't say any of that. He just says, Allah gave us some responsibilities. That's it. لا ندري ما حالنا فيها. We don't know how we did. After everything Allah gave me, I don't know. Did I do what Allah wanted me to do with those things, with those responsibilities, obligations, and rights? And then he tells his son, my son, after I leave this dunya, and then he tells him how to bury him because he's like, I don't know what's going to happen to me. After you put me into the ground, stay over my grave and pray for me. Make dua for me. That's what he tells his son. Now, you and I need to think, what stage are we at in our life? I don't think, hopefully we're not at stage one. But definitely, we might be at stage two. When a person has, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them that guidance and then they start practicing again and they start getting that nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you feel you're on stage two and you're at an iman high, you love that feeling. You're like, I'm ready to go. Allah, I'm ready. Let's do this. But then, after a little while, things become a little bit monotonous. It becomes repetitive. It becomes routine. You just come to the masjid because you have to. You come to Jum'ah because you've always come to Jum'ah. You pray because everyone prays. You fast because, yeah, that's what Muslims do. You give charity because, yeah, of course, I got to get a little bit of my money to charity. That becomes repetitive. At that stage, that, becomes, that means you're on stage three. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you all those things that you made dua for, Allah has opened for you all of those doors that you had sought to open. And now the question is, how did you fare in those affairs? How did you and I do with all the things Allah gave us responsibility over? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. How are we doing? We have to reorient ourselves and reprioritize those things that actually matter. With the month of Ramadan just a month away, just one month away, Allahumma balighna Ramadan. With just one month away, we have to actually reorient ourselves that this Ramadan is going to be something that changes my life again and again and again. So I feel like I'm starting stage two again and again and again, every single time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us so